Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are so thankful that you have carried us to this place we call home and that you've placed us in this beautiful community that we can call our family. And you, our Father, Lord, you speak good things into our life, that you have chosen us and that you have rescued us, that we would hear the truth of your love today and that we would embrace it, receive it, and then be the people who are changed into your vehicles, your vessels of love to the world, the ones who would bring joy and hope and peace into the hearts and minds of those people that don't know who you are and how much you love them. Lord, our hearts ache for those people who uh, live in the shadow of death and who have been persecuted, who have felt forsaken, who have been wounded by the evil of this world. And we know that that's not from you. And so we reject that and we embrace the truth that you will bring good from the darkness, that you will bring healing where there is hopelessness. And we pray for those people who have lived in the wake of destruction, some their whole lives. And Lord, we pray that our eyes and hearts would be open to receive the truth of their broken condition and that our legs and hands and feet would be mobilized to embrace them and carry them home. We praise you, God, for what you've done here today and for what you're about to do in our hearts and our minds. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, amen. Please have a seat. So good to see you today. Today is about transformation. Every day is about transformation. Every hour for us should be about what God can do and how any second something big can happen. All of the big things in this world have happened in the span, really, of one second. The, the transformation from there being no idea about or no hope about the future to a place of hopefulness and even creativity and engagement with the future is all things, they are all things that have taken place in, the, in a millisecond. That they've, they've happened and they've been transformative moments for people who have then extended that transformation to the world around them. Moments where people have decided to embark on campaigns of peace, who have decided to, to, to go out and address the violence that is at work in the world. People who've put their hearts and minds to work to bring about creative expressions of God's love to the world around them. Those have all taken place in the matter of a second. And so today, I hope that you are approaching your hours, your minutes, your seconds, and even the next five minutes thinking about what God might do, how you might be changed. And so a big question that you will ask going into this conversation is, are you ready for a complete transformation? Are you ready for that total transformation, that, that complete transformation that, that God can do in your life? Now, a lot of people feel that total transformation is something that, that necessitates changing all the ingredients. Like every little fiber has to change in order for total transformation to take place. But it's not true. There's something called a catalyst. And when a catalyst is introduced, the properties of everything around the catalyst change completely. That means that one millisecond, one truth, one idea, one moment, one, one word from God can change everything in a person's life. And it can be true for you or for me. That when we walk out of our front doors and we see the trees or we see the bushes or we see the sunrise or the horizon or we see some brokenness that's at work in some other person's life, that those things are the truth that we are called to embrace. Those morsels of truth that come to us through Scripture or through, through this Holy Spirit speaking into our minds. Those are the things that, that, that bring about that transformation, that total transformation. And so now today, we are going to be dipping into a story where Jesus was teaching and he was surrounded with people. He was so popular that people were pressing in on him to hear more of what he was saying. And we are going to be listening to this story that Jesus speaks to the critics who were called the, the Pharisees. These particular critics at the time were the Pharisees. And they didn't understand because they loved God and they spoke the truth about who God was, but they never were surrounded by broken people or wounded people. In fact, the, especially the ones that Jesus was surrounded by, the tax collectors, i.e. the mobsters, the worst of the worst, or the prostitutes were around Jesus during this time, and the Pharisees did not like that. And Jesus was welcoming them. He was saying, oh, this is fantastic. I'm so glad you're here. And the Pharisees were saying, it's not good that they're here. These people are the worst. 
These people have taken advantage of people. Some of them have murdered people. Some people, are, they've ruined families. They've torn apart communities. Why are you excited that they're here? And Jesus speaks a story into their hearts and minds. He speaks a story to open their mind and change their hearts. And it is this story that you'll find in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verse 1, or actually verse 3 through 8. And it starts with these words. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose someone among you had 100 sheep. Now, by the way, that's a big leap. I don't know if you were thinking of that. Like if you were just already like, hey, I've been thinking about it all morning. Now that you think about it, I was just wondering what it would be like to have 100 sheep, right? So you're imme- immediately drawn into an imaginative landscape by Jesus's words. Suppose one of you had a, a hundred sheep. You're like, oh, that would be interesting. I guess I'd have a camper as well, and I would have a dog, and I don't know. I, are, okay, you just have to go there. I want you to go there, because I'm going to go there, all right? You're going to go there, so I'm going to go there. All right, okay. That was, okay, never mind. Suppose one, someone among you had 100 sheep, and you lost one of them. Can you just go, <gasps> everybody, <gasps> someone just swallowed a fly. I just know that. You're not coughing, okay. So, um, one of you lost the sheep. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the lost one until he finds it? And most of you are sitting there going, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to abandon the 99. But no, you have to understand the 99 are good. They're okay. They're in the pasture. They're safe. But, but what Jesus is doing is he's speaking to the Pharisees who are not listening to a word that he's saying with this beautiful story of a little baby lamb. Let's just get a little image in our minds of what this would look like. That's what Jesus is doing. This, this is called spiritual jujitsu, right? Jujitsu is where you use the other person's energy in order to allow them to fail and allow them to throw themselves to the ground. Do you do jujitsu by any chance? Can you, can you come? No, I'm just kidding. So there's actually a, a, a karate champion in the front here. So uh, he's not ready to do impromptu jujitsu. But he'll tell you that jujitsu is a pretty good deal because you know what? You're, you're using the momentum, the energy of the other person in order to allow them, allow them to throw themselves down on the mat. This is, uh, this is what Jesus is doing. He is, he is using their own energy. Their, he's using their, their energy of, uh, he's throwing a baby lamb in front of them. And he says, all right, here's bait. You are going to be compassionate. I don't know about you, but if there was just this little baby lamb bleeding away on a cliff somewhere, you would just, was that a lamb? Did you hear that? <laughs> if there was just a baby lamb bleeding away on a cliff somewhere, then, then you would have a hard time sleeping at night. And that's what Jesus wants you to uh, uh, think about. That's what Jesus wants the Pharisees to encounter. And the other thing that I think is pretty clever is that Pharisees, if you want a characterization of Pharisees, you would have to say that they liked everything in its place. Is anybody like that? Like, you know, guys or girls with their tools in their garage, right? You know, just like, you gotta have all the tools in the right place. Maybe you're not that kind of person. Maybe you're the person that your car has to be neat and tidy. I'm gonna get there. Trust me, I'll find you out. I'll figure out which, what you are. Maybe you're the kind of person that's a perfectionist with eating. You like to eat everything on your plate plus everything on everybody else's plate. Or maybe you're a perfectionist at being messy. You're like, I will never be clean. I'm not going to be perfectionist, so I'm going to be imperfect in every way. Do you know that every one of us is, is like the Pharisees, who were known? This is a good example of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were known for being perfectionists. They had to get everything just right in their right place. But you see, each of us is a Pharisee. Every single one of us is a fundamentalist in our own way. We've taken the little, little, little quirks, the little, um, the little ideas that we've held on to and have gotten us to the place we are in our life, and we have judged the rest of the world by them. And we do it. Every single one of us does it. And we look at the rest of the world and we say, oh, they're, so, they're such fun- fundamentalists. I hate to break it to you, everybody is a fundamentalist. You are a fundamentalist in your desire to not be a fundamentalist. So you're a fundamentalist, non-fundamentalist. Everybody's a fundamentalist. Everyone's a Pharisee. And so the Pharisees are criticizing Jesus and saying, you know what, you have to, these people are not washing with their hands in the right way. They're not eating in the right way. They're not doing these things the right way. And the Pharisees had sought to live a perfect life. They, everything was in order. They, as far as they could tell, they weren't sinning. As far as they they could tell, they had, they had it all together. And and then Jesus says these words in, in the scripture. He goes on to tell the rest of the story. He's got their heart He's got their mind, and now he says, and when the shepherd finds it, he is thrilled, and he places it on his shoulders. 
Isn't that great, the image of the shepherd taking the sheep and placing it on its shoulders and, and traveling home? And then he goes on to say, he says, when he arrives home, he calls together his friends and, he, and his neighbors, saying to them, celebrate with me. Let's kill a sheep and eat it. No, they didn't say that. But that, that would make sense, wouldn't it? I mean, like, what else are you going to do? You're a shepherd. Time to have a party. <laughs> no, no, that's not what it says. It says, celebrate with me because I've lost, I've found my lost sheep. Um, and then Jesus says, in the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner or i.e. one lost sheep, who changes both heart and life than over the 99 religious people who have no need to change their hearts and their lives. I, I love the characterization that Jesus makes of the shepherd, that the shepherd is thrilled when he sees the sheep. When he finds that sheep, I don't know if when you're walking down the street, if when people say, how are you doing? Do you ever say, I'm thrilled? Do you ever say that? No, don't say that. That's creepy. <laughs> Stick to okay, all right? But, but Jesus says that the shepherd's thrilled. There's just that, oh, wow, this is the best. There's this moment of excitement. There's abundant joy is the best way to describe it. Over the top, abundant joy joy. That when the shepherd finds that sheep, he is so excited, he can't, he can't hold it back. He wants to shout it from the mountaintops. In fact, he goes back to his home, back to the pasture where he's taking care of the sheep, and he calls all of the neighbors together. A lot of people think when they're talking about all the neighbors, they're thinking of our current neighborhoods, by the way, like where the houses are right next to each other. And you, you like try to whisper to each other so your neighbors don't wake up, you know? No, no, we're not talking neighborhood. We're talking neighbors. So neighbors were a long way away. You had to go and get them and bring them, bring them in. Actually, a lot of you are like, I live in that neighborhood. I have a farm that's 50 acres. I know what you're talking about. So they went to get the neighbors and bring them, bring them back. Jesus is saying that there's an abundant joy that he's feeling when he's seeing that the sinners are at his feet, when he sees that these broken people are there. Jesus is sharing his heart for the people that he's encountering in that moment. He's like, hey, you know what? I, I have to let you know that there is no greater joy that I feel than to have these people near me. A lot of people say, oh, Jesus was so sacrificial in his time that he spent with the broken people of the world. I, I believe that that's actually a mischaracterization. I believe that Jesus actually enjoyed it. He was so thrilled to have those people close. That was his greatest moments of joy. All the people, oh, well, how could you bear it? No, he loved it. He was alive. He was full in those moments where the brokenness was being healed and where there was restoration for the outcasts of the world. The other thing that Jesus is saying, not just that you'll have abundant joy, not just that God has abundant joy when people who have been far off have come near, that, that they belong. You see, the Pharisees had developed this notion that all of the people who were broken in this world didn't belong. That all the people who were the worst of the worst did not, were not part of them. But what Jesus actually cleverly says is they are all sheep. That they're all sheep. That those are sheep over there. And the Pharisees had mischaracterized or misunderstood those people to be something other than them. They were, they are those people. But actually Jesus is saying, no, 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 those are children of God. They belong here. And that is, that is one of the big misnomers of the faith is that there are people who don't belong in the family. That, that there are people who should be treated as outcasts or who should, who should, when they come, not be brought to the center. But actually, Jesus brings even the most broken people right to the center and right to the place of his deepest love. And then the other thing that I think that we can learn from this passage is that change is needed. The the parable ends where Jesus says there's greater joy in heaven over the one, one sinner, the one broken person who is returned and healed, who has a change in their heart and mind is what the scripture says. Then over the 99 other that have, that have no need, he says, for a change of heart and mind. Do you know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, he's reminding them that everybody needs a change of their heart and mind. That each, and one of, each one of us is the lost. That we are all some way in need of being carried home, of being returned and, and brought back into restoration of community. 
That there's not one person, if there's one person in this, if there's one person in your mind right now that you're saying, you know what, I am so glad they don't go to Highlands Church. Then he's speaking to you. He's speaking to you because he's saying, you know what, everybody belongs. Everybody should be restored. Everybody should be returned. You know the Pharisees, do you think that they didn't have beef with the tax collectors? Or the prostitutes that had ruined their families? Or the, the tax collectors who had stolen, who had stolen from, from, from their families. See, here we live in these giant communities where, where, there's, where you could move from one community to the next and kind of abandon your past story. Do you know that? You can kind of walk away. Uh, when we lived in Pasadena, it was even more true. In Los Angeles, you could, you could burn a, a thousand people and still have new offers to do business, right? Your reputation wouldn't necessarily follow you. But Jesus was speaking to communities that were close and tight-knit in which there was brokenness and the, the pain was real and the hurt was real. And so when Jesus was talking about these, these people who were up close and the Pharisees were, were resentful that Jesus had them near, Jesus was actually saying, you know what, the, I know, he knows how much they've hurt the community. He knows how much brokenness there's been about. But he's saying, these are, these are the ones who belong to, just like you do. So Jesus was flipping on his head and he was actually saying, hey, you know what? It, there is so much rejoicing in heaven when each and every, every one of us recognize that a change is needed, that a change is needed. And lastly, Jesus is also helping the people who are listening to him to understand the heart of God. That, that God has this heart that cannot go to sleep at night. Uh, that, that when Jesus went to sleep at night, his heart was aching for those people who were far from the fold. Who, who felt that they didn't belong, who were outcast and pushed away from the community. That we too are called, Jesus is instructing us, to have a heart for those on the outside. To, to not be able to sleep at night, to wake up in the morning with a call on our hearts and a pressing on our hearts that there are people who, do, who actually believe that they don't belong. They believe that the community of God is, is not unconditional love as God extends to us. They believe that instead of uh, an embrace, that they will receive judgment. Instead of a, a, a reaction of being absolutely thrilled, thrilled that someone has had a willingness even to have a change of heart and mind. Maybe that there would be a kind of bitterness. Why? Why aren't they getting what they deserve? You know, that, that kind of path that we all are led down at different parts in our life. Jesus wants each and every one of us to be the ones who are willing and bold enough to go after the one. To go after the one that, that is lost. The one that, 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 that others have forgotten about. There's a story in my family about a sheep that got lost about 100 years ago. Uh, my family comes from the island of Skye, and it's a story that's given to me by my, my, by my aunt Morig, Morig Henriksen, who still lives there. She's so great. She, she's just a, she preserves the old arts and the old stories of that area and even the old language and teaches it to children. One of the stories is a story about a Sunday morning when, when a shepherd had discovered that the sheep had been lost one sheep had been lost. And so, so the, the men and women left and went in search of that sheep. They went all over this island looking for the sheep. And finally, they looked over the edge and they found the edge of a 500-foot cliff and they found this sheep stranded on a ledge. And they'd realized that the, the sheep had been gone for about 15 days is what the story says. And so what had happened is this sheep had apparently been there all 15 days. Um, and by the way, that's what sh sheep are dumb. They just find themselves on cliffs, right? <laughs> and, and, and what had happened is the sheep had slowly been eating away the, the, the ground beneath it, chewing away the grass. Again, they're not the smartest, right? But what took place then was something that we would not, you know, embrace by modern safety standards, but they lowered one of the shepherds over the cliff to get down to the sheep, to rescue it, and to bring it back to safety. I believe that the men and women who 
participated in that Sunday morning rescue of that sheep walked away with a greater sermon than they'd probably ever heard in their life. I believe that each and every person who has the willingness and boldness and the courage to go over the cliffs of this world to rescue the people who are stranded, the people who are lost, the people who've been there maybe more than 15 days, maybe for 15 years, and felt that the world has forgotten about them and doesn't care. I believe that that is where the gospel takes root. That is where the sermons are preached. Do you think that like a hundred years later, or at least for the rest of their lifetime, those shepherds were talking about that rescue of that sheep from that cliff? I'll bet, I'll bet you there wasn't a single Sunday that didn't go by where they didn't talk about one detail of that story. And they said, no, oh, no, grandpa, not again. We don't want to hear it. Do you believe that there's, there's, a, there's a pastor in a church in California a hundred years later that's still talking about this story of the sheep being rescued? They have no idea. On Easter Sunday, last week, it was, it was something that we should have expected because God does things that, you know, surprise us all the time. Last year, we had such an abundant, beautiful Easter worship service. There were 900 people here. And we were like, whoa, this is incredible. And we're just so humbled if people, if we'd have the opportunity to, to welcome people and, and draw them into a place of worship and to just, just even if you just think about one person, one person who ha, have, would have one momentary transformation, one catalytic experience where the one, one minute they would start to find themselves go, go from a place of hope, hopelessness to a hopefulness. Just so amazing. I remember in conversations beforehand, we talked about, hey, you know what? We have to remember that if one person, one person experiences that depth of transformation, then it's all worth it. Every little bit of it. Well, then, uh, then we had people come and fill up all the chairs, and then we had to set up extra chairs and more chairs and more chairs. Last week, there weren't 900 people there. There were 1,400 people that came to Easter services here. It was like an overflow, and our breath was taken away. We couldn't believe what was happening. And, and there's, such an, there's, there's this thing that happens in, in the overflow and the abundance where we can tend to get a blur about what God is doing. We can tend to get a little bit con, like distorted and, and kind of turn everything into a kind of a just, just one monochromatic picture rather than recognizing the beautiful details the beautiful moments that are taking place. There's, uh, have you ever guys, guys ever heard of a terrible person named Stalin before? By the way, terrible person like us, I should say. One that Jesus would have been thrilled to see at his feet. But nonetheless, Stalin was responsible for the murder of millions of people. And Stalin, in his darkest darkest moments, he said that the death of a million people is a statistic and the death of one person is a tragedy. And it's really true. Uh, recently we've seen in Yemen, Saudi Arabia has been responsible for the death of millions of people there. Nobody really cared about it for years. They're just kind of like, okay, well, Saudi Arabia, we just, it's terrible, it's a tragedy, it's like famines, it's kind of, you know, people are dying, it's war, those kinds of things. And then one journalist gets killed, one person named Khashoggi gets killed, and people say, we will not stand up for this level of brutality anymore. See, what happens with the one, when we change our focus and we start to zero in on the one, the wounds of the one, the pain of the one, the, the hopelessness of the one, we have this yearning in our hearts to respond to the one. Jesus is saying if we want to change the world, we change it one person at a time. If you look through the ser sermons of Jesus, you look through the lessons of Jesus, Jesus will talk about the one. He will talk about how one is the path forward. And we'll talk about how, how it's those one simple things that will change everything, those moments where, where suddenly we will no longer be the people who are oblivious to injustice. We'll say, oh, it's okay. It's not my responsibility, but when we see the one, when we see our mission and our purpose is to reach the one, you know, a lot of the reason I think that we don't respond to the tragedies, we don't res respond to the total devastation of the world is because we get overwhelmed. How many other people feel like that? 
We get overwhelmed. We just, we, we just, we can't bear it anymore. We can't continue to die, dig deep into the, into the misery and the pain because the news just keeps coming at us one after another, one terrible thing after another. And you're like, wow, cheery sermon, James, right after Easter. Thanks a lot. But Jesus, has, Jesus is a master at telling these stories that will open our hearts and minds and our souls so that we will be the people that will live out compassion in the world. How many people, for example, have ever felt lost in their life? Ever, ever, ever. Like, I'm talking really lost, like, 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 like as a little kid. Oh, no one? I was the only one that ever was like in, a, in like that, that one moment in the grocery store where it's like, I feel like my mother's never going to come back again, right? And she's like one aisle over. You're like, no! Nah! You know? <laughs> right? Or just like frozen. That's the other reaction. She's like, <gasps> you know? She's like, I think I'll just eat the grass under my feet. You know? I don't know. Because we can all identify with it. We've all been in that place. We've all been lost. Every Pharisee, every person who's lost or broken or sin, we're all in the same boat. We're all those people. And if we can find a way to identify with the people out there and recognize that they are no different than the people in here, then it's game over. See, Jesus would want us to, to have the courage of the Sunday morning shepherds the courage of those who would be willing to go and do anything in order to bring somebody home. What happened today, what happens every Sunday, is that there are people who are coming home. They are finding their family. They are discovering their identity in God the Father. They are discovering that Jesus, Jesus, the one, loved them so much that he gave up his one life so that all could live. And so this is the beginning, this one series. This is, this, is, this is a journey that we're about to take that I am so excited about. And I can't wait to show you the stories of one that Jesus, Jesus preaches over and over and over again. The way in which he makes his life about one. And he wants us to be ones, the pe- ones who have our eyes and ears open to the message of one. Because it is the catalytic, it is, it is that catalytic thing that changes everything. What if each one of us, just right now, thought about the one that we were called to reach, right? And we all go out there and we start to to do things that are extraordinary, like go over the cliffs of life to reach them on their ledges. What if each one of us, and what if only 30 of us actually did it? And only 10 of us actually were able to bring those people home. But one of those people that we were able to bring home was then a catalyst that would then impact the lives of another 100 people and we continue to do this, we would begin to see the dramatic, beautiful change that we have all yearned for in our lives. See, the Pharisees always wanted to see beautiful things in the world. They always wanted to see, see God's kingdom take place. But you see, their way of doing it was by excluding, and Jesus' way of doing it was by saying, you must include, and the way you're going to do it is by identifying one sheep, one lost sheep at a time, and you are going to have to lift them up and put them on your shoulders and bring them home. And every single time you do it, you're going to have to have a crazy big party with all of your neighbors to celebrate. That's the vision that Jesus welcomes us into. And it's faith because it calls us into those places that are tough. They calls us into places of reconciliation and forgiveness and the journey forward. Jesus doesn't promise that it's going to be easy to see your greatest enemy sitting at his feet. Free. No longer living in condemnation for the lives that they've lived. But instead, enjoying the same freedom you have and the same depth of love and experience and salvation, not just now, but forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you carried us home, that you laid down your life so that you could put us on your shoulders and bring us, bring us back. Lord Jesus, we pray for what you're doing in this community, the way in which that happened on Easter Sunday, that each and every person found themselves carried forward by you. We pray that this, this, is, this is the moment where we are at the starting line of an, a dynamic journey called One, where we press in to hear your voice speaking in ways that are transformative. 
We pray that through this journey, there would be people who have those, those one minute tra- moments of transformation. Maybe that happened here today, God. And if that is true, we hear the angels singing. We hear the celebrations of heaven in our hearts and minds. And so, God, we are so thankful for what you've done in this community. We're so thankful uh, that you have given this, this church the heart of searching after the one. We're so thankful that, that we have all the privilege and experience of being carried by you back into the family and given the, the powerful mission to go into the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Please stand. This is the time we call giving back. And it's, it's the moment where we've heard the vision and we've heard the mission. And now we have the opportunity to endorse it and say, we believe in it and we want to fuel that mission with our time, with our talents, with our prayers even. Uh, the cards that you receive today, fill those out and, 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 and contribute what you have. Because what you have is more than enough because it is about being invested and wedded to this mission of reaching the, the one. And so celebrate now. Celebrate right now because this is, this is the moment we've, we recognize where God has done what God said God would do. And God is doing what God has said God will do. And the future we can, we can trust and have faith that God will continue to fuel us and provide for us and give us all that is needed for the journey ahead. Amen? That's not loud enough. Amen? Amen. That's still not loud enough. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Let's worship.
주님 